Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. For these next two weeks, I want to talk to you from the Scriptures about um, basically the early church trying to figure things out in what was an unprecedented season, right? When Jesus was raised from the dead to life eternal, that was unprecedented in every, in every sense of the word, right? And so these earliest followers of Jesus were trying to figure out and adapt and understand what it meant for them now to live in a world where God's kingdom had broken in and where they were experiencing the life of the future in the present. Already, not yet, if you want to go back to that sermon some time ago. All right? Unprecedented in, in, uh, in, in the, what they were trying to figure out and So this is what happened. They were all gathered together. The Holy Spirit fell upon them just as Jesus had told them what happened. And and this incredible miracle took place. They, they, They spread out into the streets of the city of Jerusalem and they're declaring the wonders of God. And people from all different places are understanding them, speaking in all these different languages. And it draws a crowd. And the Apostle Peter stands up. And he says, he addresses the crowd, and he basically preaches this sermon about how God had raised Jesus from the dead, and what must we do? You must repent because God God has started a new thing, and then thousands of people commit themselves at that moment to be Jesus' followers in faith. Now, in Acts chapter 3, as the Bible says that they have begun now to worship together in the temple te- with, for teaching, and then go from home to home for fellowship. That's the pattern that's been established now. And when we get to our text today in Acts chapter 3, that's the background, all right? So this is what it says in Acts chapter 3. It says, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. It was three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Now, when this man saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Well, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping, praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you today for your goodness toward us, that you see each of us where we are. You know the sum of our hearts and our lives, God. You know everything about us even better than we know ourselves. And so at this moment, as we come before you today and as we listen to your word, we pray, would you reveal our own hearts to us? And Lord, would you work and heal our own hearts? Would you do a work in us that when we're done uh, with these moments together and when, when we have allowed you to speak to us, God, we would be changed and different because of it. We want to continue to walk with you and to serve you with joy and in fruitfulness for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to talk because... Uh, about this particular text because I really believe that this is the start of something powerful and it's paradigmatic, it's programmatic for what you and I uh, could be experiencing in our lives. I know it's crazy to say, but I want to continue to believe that 
life-changing miracles like the one that we see here in the book of Acts could continue to happen today. And so I want to ask the question, what is it that these two men had, Peter and John, having followed Jesus that we could look at and apply to our lives? And if you're taking notes, I want you just to start right now because I want to try and get right into it. Number one, what they had was they had relationship. These two guys, Peter and John, were fishermen who had taken an early retirement in order to follow Jesus. They were pretty young. Jesus had actually invited them to follow him, and they left their nets behind. We talked about this last week, and they actually just set out to follow Jesus. And they had learned in the process not just how to walk with Jesus, but how to walk with one another. And if you look at that ragtag group of of people who were following Jesus in his earthly ministry, you'll see these were people who were very far apart on, on, on whatever spectrum you want to look at. On the political spectrum, they were very far apart. Peter would have been considered, he considered himself a zealot, we know from the scriptures, which was, he was completely anti-government. <laughs> the Roman government in place at the time, Peter was a part of a group of people that believed that the only way forward would be to overthrow the government. And then you had Matthew, remember him? He authored one of the gospels. We have Matthew who was one of Jesus' followers and he was a tax collector. So he was completely in line with the Roman government when Jesus called him. And so you have Peter who was on this one side completely against it. Matthew over here who was completely for it and now they're walking together following Jesus. And the beauty of this is that because they had chosen to make their identity in Jesus be the primary source of identity in their lives, they were able to find common ground. I, I actually want to want to probably make a guess that it even shifted some of their views that they had before. <laughs> and so I think it's beautiful that Peter, whether it be Peter and Matthew or here in our text, Peter and John have learned to walk together even as they're following Jesus. Remember when Jesus said that thing where he said, uh, I think it was in Matthew 28, he said, if, if two or three would agree on anything in my name, the Father will give it to them. And I think, man, what if Jesus had said five or six, right? If five or six, because, you know, if five or six, and I'm so thankful he didn't, because five or six people can rarely agree on anything. If you've ever tried with five people to decide on what to get for dinner, you realize it's impossible to agree on anything. So isn't it great that Jesus sets the bar so low and he says, if two or three will agree on anything in my name, the Father will honor that. I love that. Because I think that revolutions, I know, I should say, I know that revolutions have been started by two or three. And I want you to consider that today. Peter and John were together as they went to the temple. Just the two of these guys. They had no grand strategy. They had no five-point plan that they were trying to work out. They were just together. They had relationship. And God used them. In this, uh, in this month... I'd say like kind of at the end of the month, actually in the beginning, in the middle of September, we're going to kick off a new season of small groups. And small groups are tough during this time because, you know, the, the question is how do we gather and how do we make that work? And some groups could be in person and some groups could be online and some might be a little bit of both. And we're going to kind of try out all that, and men's groups, and we've got financial peace that's going to happen to help you, you know, develop some financial literacy and get your finances in line. We've got women's groups and couples, and this is, I know, a tough time to commit to anything. One of the things that I've observed is that people are really hesitant to commit to anything, but I really believe if I'm looking at my text here today, my hope, my challenge to everybody here is that you'd find a pace and a setting that will work for you to connect with others because because it's so important. What Peter and John had was relationship, and they valued it, and they clearly, uh, you know, honored that, and God clearly honored their relationship and their commitment to one another. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Whatever they lacked in talent... I think, was made up for in togetherness. 
And that's, that, that is the heart of what I'm saying today. If you're going to walk away with anything from this sermon, I want you to recognize this, that you and I being committed to one another and to being to actual relationship, knowing one another in a deep and meaningful way and being committed to one another, that that is more important than anything else in God's estimation. In, uh, in John chapter 20, Jesus has raised, been raised from the dead, but his disciples have heard the news, but they don't, they're fearful, they don't know, they're, be, they're literally in a room behind a locked door. And Jesus doesn't wait for permission even to, he doesn't knock on the door at all, he just literally appears in their midst. And then the first thing he says is, peace be with you. And a lot of times we think of it as like Jesus like had his greeting where he's like, you know, peace be with you, what to do, you know, something like that, where it was like, it, you know, but I, I actually think that they were so terrified that Jesus was like, peace, chill, peace be with you, everything's okay, because they were so scared that he would just appear in that room with them. And then Jesus has this conversation with them, and he says this. He says, as the Father has sent me, so now I'm sending you. And the Bible says then that he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says this weird thing where he says, whoever sins you forgive will be forgiven. And whoever sins you don't forgive will not be forgiven. Now that is a troubling text that we could, take a, we could tackle at another time. But I want to sum it up. I want to sum it up by saying like this. The way that Jesus is sending you and me into the world is like this. Walk in the Spirit and embody forgiveness. That's it. He says, the same way that the Father sent me, walking in the Spirit, embodying forgiveness, that's what I'm doing with you. I'm sending you into the world. Walk in the Spirit and embody forgiveness. Now, in our world today, there is, there is a, a, a terrible lack, I would say, of those two things. There is all kinds of manipulation. There's all kinds of score settling. There's one-upmanship. There's selfishness. But here's the thing. If you and I are a people who will walk together filled with the Spirit and embodying forgiveness, something is going to stand out and something is going to make a mark. If you and I will do as Jesus said and recognize we have been sent in the world walking in the Spirit and embodying forgiveness, let me tell you, there is going to be a change. It's not about our talent. It is about our togetherness. It's not about the problem in our world. If you look at in our, in our cities, if you look at communities, if you look at families, it's generally, generally not because there is a lack of resources. It's because there's a lack of relationship. There's not enough trust. There's not enough relationship to connect the resources with the people who need them. And so what I'm saying is if you and I will actually walk in the Spirit and embody forgiveness, if we'll commit to relationship with one another, then we're going to start seeing some miracles take place and some lives being transformed. When I come home from work uh, or I come home from anywhere, or maybe Jesse comes home and I'll say hi to her and I'll give her a big hug or something like that, Wherever our daughter, our four-year-old Ava is at that moment, she will come. It doesn't even matter if I'm coming home or if it's just a random moment where we're just kind of give her a hug in the kitchen. Ava will come running from wherever she is and she'll be, start be yelling, sandwich hug, sandwich hug, sandwich hug. And she will like literally run in between us because she wants, she sees the affection, she sees the love, she sees that there, and she just wants to be in the middle of it. <laughs> and I, I love that because Anytime you see people who love each other, there's something beautiful and attractive about that, right? There's something that says, I, I kind of want to get in the middle of that. And I think we've overcomplicated this whole thing as churches. We've overcomplicated this whole thing as believers. If we will just love one another and commit to relationship, there'll be plenty of people who want to get in the middle of that. And here, watch this. Just to kind of throw a fine point theologically on this. The Father... And the Son and the Holy Spirit, the God that we talk about that's revealed in the Scripture, He loves to see that happening. Because if I understand correctly, 
God himself existed before time, before creation, in joy-filled, loving community with himself, the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit, meaning God didn't need to create something in order to have love. God had love beforehand. God, enjo- God didn't need to create you and me in order to have community. God has community with himself, and as mysterious as that might be, that's the way that theologians have understood that over the years, and so this is what I think happens. When God sees other people in joy field joy-filled, loving community with one another, he says, oh, that looks like a place that I should be. And I think God is drawn to that. And so if we want to see the presence of God, here, commit to relationship. Number two, they didn't just have relationship, they had a rhythm. Peter and John had a rhythm of prayer and time in the temple. They were looking at, they were doing, committed to something beyond themselves. It was their habit And what happened with this incredible miracle was not something they had planned for or strategized for. It just happened in the midst of their rhythm, right? Now, C.S. Lewis, in one of his essays about friendship, says this. He says that lovers, people who are in love, they face each other. But friends, that's a different kind of posture. It's a shoulder-to-shoulder relationship, not face-to-face. I mean, I think about it when you when we do a, a wedding ceremony and we have that couple face one another and they make their vows and this is a, a powerful moment and that's a wonderful thing. But what happens is over time, any marriage relationship, even a marriage relationship, I should say, has to transform from a face-to-face to also be a shoulder-to-shoulder relationship, meaning this, that we are walking together with a shared vision for our lives. We are walking together with this idea that... that uh, that, that, um, it, that we're committed to the same set of values. We're committed to a common goal. We're moving shoulder to shoulder through our lives. That's friendship. And even in a marriage, that becomes the most important thing. It's not just about looking face to face. It's about walking and standing shoulder to shoulder. Listen to people who've been married for, you know, like 50 years. And you say, what is it that you love about your, you know, ask her, what is it that you love about your husband? And she doesn't, she rarely says biceps, you know. <laughs> she rarely says, you know, oh, he's just so, so hot or whatever else like that. That might have been the thing at the beginning that they were attracted to, that they loved about one another. But now what they say is, I love how we've built a life together. This is my best friend. You see, that's the kind of thing that, take, that, that makes people take notice. Now, to be friends requires time and effort and forgiveness and understanding. Long-term investments always require that we ride things out even when the market takes a dip, so to speak. We recognize that when we're in friendship with people, it's gonna, there are going to be times where it's a little messier than others. So one of the things that we say all the time is we'll choose, we'll choose messy over easy when it comes to people every time. Because when we are loving people in this way, when we are committed to friendship, things usually get messy. So we just plan for it. We account for it when we're building friendships and we invest for the long term. So here's the thing. Peter and John, they had a rhythm to what they were doing. There was a regular investment looking outside of themselves. And this is what I want you to see. They had that relationship. They had that rhythm. And then thirdly, they had a hand to offer. They didn't have much right? They weren't trained. They weren't doctors. Here this man is. He's been crippled, the Bible says, since birth. These guys, they they don't have any way to really help him. They're not magicians. They didn't have anything else other than they had access to the Father in Jesus' name. And they said, hey, we don't have much, but what we have we'll give to you. Now, I want you to see this. Whatever setting that you are in, I'm going to guess that you probably haven't had the answers for every need that's in the setting you're in, whether it's your own home, whether it's in your, on your street, whether it's in your community or your workplace, whatever it is. I'm going to guess that you don't have all the answers, but let me tell you what you do have. If you have, if you will bring Jesus into the conversation, it will substantively change things. If you will bring Jesus into the conversation, it will actually open up the door for the life and the the power of God to actually begin to work in your situation. Peter said, I don't have a handout for you, sir, but I have something better. I have a hand up. And if it weren't for Jesus at the center of this conversation, it wouldn't have mattered. But he says, because I have the name of Jesus, I've got something to give to you. And so here's the thing I want you to see. The miracle isn't in your hand. The hand is just an expression of faith. 
The miracle is in the name of Jesus. It's the hand extended. I don't know if that man would have gotten up had it not been for Peter extending his hand and saying, let me help you up. But let me, do you think it was Peter's hand that did, that, that, that really was the power? No. The power was in the name of Jesus, but it was the hand extended that actually invited that man to respond in faith. I think that there's something powerful when we say silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. They said, I I don't have, what I only can give you what I have. And here's what I want you to know. When you have a routine of following Jesus in relationship with others, he will always give you what is needed for the for the for the, the needs that are in front of you. He will always provide for you so that you can extend a hand to others in need. It's amazing in one incredible moment, ligaments and muscles and you, whatever it is, these things, this, this part of his, this man's legs and his feet that never had functioned before somehow came into the right place. Somehow God moved these things together and strengthened them so not only did he stand up when he was helped up, but he also began to leap up and praise the Lord so that everybody took notice. This is, I think it's an incredible, incredible thing. They said, isn't this the guy who used to be begging at the gate beautiful? And, and, and the other people were like, yeah, like two minutes ago, I just walked by him and he was begging over there. But this is what happens, I think, is that Peter and John, in the midst of their regular rhythm of looking outside of themselves, because of their relationship with one another, are walking together, and God brings them to the place where there was need. And if you follow Jesus together long enough with people, You will find yourself, you will find yourself, Jesus will lead you to places of need all the time. (laughs) Following Jesus, Jesus will lead you to poor people, he'll lead you to children, and he'll lead you to those who are marginalized. That's where Jesus is going to lead. So I just want to give you a heads up. When you walk in relationship with people as you follow Jesus, Jesus is going to take you just as you do it in the regular rhythm of thing. You're going to find yourself in positions to be able to help those who are in need. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to strategize for it. I love how that's the case. Our strategy here at our church at New City is, is to live out the good news outside of our walls, to leave the building and to take the good news uh, and, and, and to deliver it through different ways. And I want, I want to talk about it because I know some of you guys have heard this before, and so forgive me if it's old to you, but I, I want to continue to put this out there because what we call our peace plan is really significant because whether we're talking about locally here in Chicago, whether we're talking about internationally in places around the world, we want to invest in these different places. And we, we, we talk about it like this, partnership, education, arts, compassion, and enterprise. These are the, 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 the places where we want to invest resources, where we want to extend a hand to people. And so partnering with people who are around the world doing great work and, and in our area doing great work, we want to mobilize people because we believe that the church mobilized is the hope of the world. Then we want to talk about education, mentorship of young people. We want to prepare others so that they can be a blessing. We want to speak the language of beauty to culture, and we want to cultivate a, 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 Christian, under, uh, a Christian view of the arts. We want to actually meet people at their place of need through compassion. And then this one is the one I love. It's the long play. But we're saying, you know what? In so many instances, if we could just help people nurture a creative and responsible way of building business and enterprise, we're going to see things begin to elevate in different places where there has been historic and chronic need. That's what we say. We, this is our peace plan. And this is our way, really, of saying we want to extend a hand. And you know what? Here's the thing, guys. I am confident that if we walk in relationship with the right people, we're going to find the right needs to meet. We're not going to have to go looking and say, you know, how to, we're just going to, God is going to bring us to those places. And so I will just tell you what my approach is. My approach is to respect relationship. My approach is to say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to love people. I want to walk in relationship, follow Jesus with people who I know, whose hearts are passionate for Jesus, and say, you know what, as we do that, I know we're going to find the places where we can extend a hand and where God can work a miracle. There was a missionary named C.T. Studd, and he said this, some people want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell, but I want to run a mission a yard from the gates of hell. I love that quote 
Because I think it shows the determination of somebody who recognizes God's purpose and God's calling on them. Even in this season of pandemic, I want to tell you God's purposes are not canceled for you. Even in this season, God's calling on your life has not been canceled. The year was 1943, and there was a lady named Vesta Stout. That name could only come from 1943. Vesta Stout had two sons who were serving in the United States Navy, and they were in combat in World War II. Now, she, like many other people at the time who were here stateside, were working in ways that were supporting the war effort, and so she, was, she had a job at an ordnance plant in Amboy, Illinois, in southern Illinois. One of the things that Vesta noticed was that the boxes, of, the boxes that would house ammunition that she was packing and expecting, inspecting, they all had a flaw because they were sealed with this paper tape and the, there was a tab that could open them, but the paper tape was so thin that it would break and tear off. And what that meant was in combat, there'd be these soldiers who were trying to open these ammunition boxes and they couldn't do it. So, you know, she's thinking of her sons, right? I don't want my sons to be in this position where they can't respond to what's going on. And so she thought, why not create a cloth tape that is waterproof that could seal the boxes instead? So she came up with the, the, this design, and she submitted, to, submitted it to her supervisors at this plant, and they said, no, thank you. But this is where I know that she was a mom, because she was, like, unwilling to be deterred. <laughs> so what she did is she put all of, her, all of her thoughts and ideas together, and she wrote to President Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> she wrote a letter to him, which he actually read, and it had... The solution, it had the problem, the solution, and it had diagrams of how she wanted to do this. And literally, he was so impressed by this that he passed it on to his staff people who, who, who found a contractor who would actually make this, and they began to produce it for the war effort, and today we call it duct tape. <laughs> that was the birth of duct tape because Vesta Stout cared so much about her sons that she was willing to not be deterred by somebody who didn't want to give her a place. I love this because I think whatever we love, we will be determined to bless. Whatever we love, we will be determined to protect. And I, I think this is fantastic because I really believe that when you and I are walking in relationship with one another and with Jesus, we are going to start to love the things that he loves. That's why we're going to be determined, even through pandemic, to do what God has called us to do. Even in the midst of this unprecedented time, we say, you know what? It doesn't matter what the challenges are. We're determined to be God's people for the world that he loves. The Bible says that God himself expressed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In such a way did God love the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And this is what the Bible says. It says, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but through his son to save it. Now that rubs some people the wrong way. Because to be told that I need to be saved means that there's something broken inside of me. And this, I believe, is the core message that some people might need to hear today. There is not one of us that is smart enough, good enough, together enough, rich enough, connected enough. Nobody is, is any of those things enough to be able to meet the need that we have in our own lives, to be healed of our own sin and selfishness. The root cause in our world today comes back to that. And let me tell you, God loved the world in such a way that he said, let me deal with the root cause and let me do it at my own cost. And he sent his only son. We say every week, if you haven't settled up with God, if you haven't been made right with your heavenly father, this is the moment to do it. And to do it is as simple as ABC, to admit that you need to be forgiven, that you have need of God's grace, to believe that God has provided the way to do so through Jesus Christ, who the Bible says became sin for us so that we might be put right with God. And then to confess it, that's the C. A, B, C, confess it with your mouth. And so if that's you today and you need to do that, I'm going to lead you in a confession, in a prayer today 
to simply say, I want you to make my life new today. Let's go ahead and let's pray it together. Wherever you are, if this is you, just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my guilt, and my shame, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with the Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.